All right, Chris, you have a background in derivatives trading. You have a commercial pilot's license, or at least a rating. You're the co-author of Meltdown back in 2018. Yeah. Uh, you looked at things like Macondo Well, Columbia, Challenger, Air France, 447. Uh, you looked at quite a few things to understand how complex systems fail. Um, and then recently, I discovered you became familiar and excited about John Boyd's Observe, Orient, Decide, Act Loop. So my question yeah. to you is, why should anybody, any business leader, any safety leader, any sports coach, anybody listen to this conversation about a person who has a derivatives trading background, um, bio, what, biochemistry degree and physics degree from Harvard, who's a pilot, wrote a co-authored a book, Meltdown. Why should they listen to you? What, what, what message can you bring to folks that is so darn important today? Well, I don't, I mean, my, my honest answer is I don't know if they should listen to me. I mean, that's, that's kind of where, where, where I'll start as a baseline. But the thing, I, the thing I always invite people to do is just to try stuff on. I mean, even when I am in the seat of the expert, you know, at the front of a room doing a keynote or whatever, my, my invitation is always, you know, hey, let, let's, just, let's just try this on. Like, let's just see, let's see, see, how, see how this lands with you and, and, and try it out. So, so that's kind of, you know, without, without trying to be cheeky, that's sort of my, that's really my first, my first answer here. Um, so that's, I guess, what I would invite people to do. I, I will, you know, you can, you, you can, listen, you can, you can tune out at any time. Right, right. There's no uh, requirements for survival. Uh, that's what I tell folks. So you, you have an opportunity to listen or you can go do something else. There's no requirement to actually survive and thrive in this volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous that's world. Right. So with that said, um, you, you started looking at the OODA loop, I believe, in the last year or so. Uh, what brought you to that and how are you using that right now? Yeah, so so you you mentioned being a you mentioned being a pilot. So I'm I'm a I'm a flight instructor. Um, so I, I I teach people how to fly. That's not my that's not my primary thing. And I usually don't teach primary students. I usually work with with folks who are sort of more advanced in their in their training. Um, but what um, you know for me? Oh, so so the the short answer to your question is somebody who who is at my my flying club. Somebody who's at my flying organization. Um, they uh, they recommended um, the who is it John Corum I can't remember his name yeah. the, the guy who wrote the biography of of Boyd they recommended that book to me and um, and I read it and I was like man this is pretty interesting and um, I, I reached out to my cousin's actually a pretty pretty senior in the Marine Corps I talked with him about it he was like oh yeah like we 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 love this stuff you know me and my my peers in the marine corps like this is this is kind of how we think about things these days so for me right. you know boyd in the uda loop it's a paradigm shift right it is kind of a you know a shift away from from planning a shift away from the kind of you know static declarative nature of the world declarative nature of strategy that many people uh take on to a a a, a method that is responsive and iterative i mean in some sense, I think about it as, you know, as kind of waterfall development is to agile development in the software world, right? The, the you know, kind of planning, strategic planning is to the OODA loop in, in the kind of broader world of decision making. And, you know, you won't be surprised. You mentioned Meltdown. Meltdown's all about how the world's getting more complex. We need, mm -hmm. we need not just new tools. We need a different paradigm to, to, to yeah. deal in this complex world. That's kind of how I think about it. Okay, so you got a nice little connection back to aviation in the Marine Corps with Job Boyd's Observe, Orient, Decide, and Act Loop. We could spend more time on that, but but there's so many more things we can discuss today. Uh, and I want to get back to your cockpit time to understand a little bit of what you brought, uh, lessons that you learned from the co cockpit and bring them over to the business side. So what are you able to bring over from uh, flying? Yeah, so, you know, I, I guess the, the, the first thing to say is when I was learning to fly, I took a sort of hiatus in the middle of my flying journey. So I, I started learning in 2006. Um, my, I, I then moved with my company over to Tokyo. And, you know, there's really, there's, there's, there's no flying in Tokyo. There's just, it's just not, it's, it wasn't, wasn't a possibility. But I still was engaged. I still wanted to be engaged. So I started reading a lot about um, accidents, about accident, you know, accident reports, what went wrong. And at the same time, we were just coming up on the financial crisis. And so, you know, the arc of aviation, the arc of safety in aviation is this arc of really like starting to learn. It's, a, it's, it's kind of about going from declaring that things are this certain static way to 
learning from accidents, learning from incidents, learning from near misses, and using those things to really drive a culture of a culture of safety and a culture of excellence. And and it's also the story of recognizing the importance of culture, right? So you get to something like crew resource management, cockpit resource management. It's all about how do you communicate with people and what I started to get interested in, particularly as the financial crisis hit, and I sort of had a front row seat to that, what I started to get interested in was what, what's the, like, what is the relationship between how leaders, the culture that leaders create and their, the capabilities of their teams? And I think the seed for me for that question really was in aviation. And then as I started to see it first on Wall Street where I was working, and then, and then Deepwater Horizon blew up. We had the Maconda yeah. Well, um, uh, you know, loss of containment. Um, so I, I then realized it was much bigger and it was really that, that planted the seeds for this exploration of complexity, this exploration of, of kind of, you know, what, what was, of, of what, what meltdown is about. And, and, and to some extent, what my work today still sort of, still sort of touches on. All right. Uh, you brought up uh, crew resource management, the charm school. I think you wrote about it in your book and you heard about the same thing in team of teams from Stanley McChrystal, Joe McChrystal. Um, there's something very important about aviation CRM that we've talked about on the show. We've had people that actually worked on that years ago. And right cool. now we know it to be the foundation of team science. So you have an example of how do you use CRM in a, uh, within a dental space, right? How, how a dentist can use it or yeah. a, a dentist's office can use it. Uh, we've been talking about this for years and you brought up Macondo. Well, I don't think a lot of our listeners, they may or may not know that uh, back after Deepwater Horizon, there's a series of accidents in 2007 to 2011, where uh, the international oil and gas producers uh, looked to aviation crew resource management and said, this is what we need to do on our rigs to make sure uh, we have safe operations, you know, social technical systems, safe operations. What's been excluded is the rest of the organization, Right. Everybody yeah. looks at this and goes, that's only for those people at the edge that are actually doing the work. For us in the business, working in downtown Houston yeah. or Dallas, we don't need to know how to work together as a team. And that's bullshit, right? Yeah. And that's, yeah. So uh, I think you did a nice job in bringing that in, into your book. Um, and again, my background is in fighter aviation, naval aviation. We see that connection. But I just want to thank you for making that connection in your book. It's, it's pretty solid there. How about uh, derivatives trading? Um, what, what did you bring from that space? What did you learn about? maybe risk management and things like that. Yeah, it's interesting. So the, the, the firm I was at was a, I was at a proprietary trading company, which just, just means they, they traded for their own, you know, the, they, they, they owned the money basically. So, so one of the partners of the firm, and I, I didn't really think about this until years later, but one of the partners of the firm, he was a, he was an ex nuclear Navy guy. And, um, and I, I think the concept, one of the concepts that, that he really brought that was in the culture was uh, two things. One, you know, it, it doesn't matter the level of the person that is there, right? The the kind of the operator, the person in the seat, they make the call, even if even if you know they they've they've been in that seat for six months, right? If they're the person in the seat, they're the person making. You don't. It, it, it's not that you don't question their decision making in a constructive way. It's that you don't. Um, it, you know, you re you recognize that. <laughs> you know, seniority, experience, like. It's this, it's this concept um, that David Marquette has. I love the way he articulates mm -hmm. it. It's that you, you, know, you push the context down, you don't bring the decision-making up, right? And so right. I, I really like that. So that was really one of the contexts I took. And I think as part of that context is, you know, I was at a place that really, the, the leaders really model the speak up and a listen up culture, right? So they would talk about their own mistakes. They would praise people for talking about mistakes. That was huge. That was a huge, huge thing. And I think it was part of what made us good as an organization. Um, and that came the from the, the nuclear side of the Navy, right? Is that where you I th think that I think came, it came from? I think it came from that. And I think it came from, you know, the real experience that these, that these guys all had as, um, and I, I say guide because they were all guys, mm -hmm. as kind of, you know, operators who... They weren't necessarily good at like nuanced communication, but they did want people to speak up and they knew when people spoke up that it was important to listen to them. So, right. so that was kind of two things that two things that I took. And then, you know, I'll bring this cultural element in when the financial crisis started. Um, so, you know, kind of late, late 07, I was in, I was actually sort of splitting my time between Tokyo and New York at the time. And one of the things that was that, that I remember thinking, I had this thought like, 
wow, you know, some, some banks, some organizations, they're going to be way better at managing this risk than others. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't really figure out why I thought that. I, I, but, you know, I knew I didn't have any inside information about these places. You know, I knew people there kind of socially, professionally, mm -hmm. but it was like, oh, you know, bank A, they're going to do a better job of managing this risk than bank B. And I didn't like write down that hypothesis and, and you know, kind of like track it over time. But it made me curious, it made me curious of like, what's this connection between kind of organizational culture and the ability to manage these big, big risks. And so that for me was, that was, that's really the question that kind of, you know, probably about 10 years later led to yeah. the publication of Meltdown. So what, what is that secret sauce then? And I, I have an idea. I want to hear it from you. What, what allows an organization to manage risk in a complex environment? I, I know we can't manage risk that we can't see, but what, what, in your opinion, what is that? Um, I, I think one thing is, uh, this, this is a good question. I don't, I don't know that I've parameterized this recently in okay. these ways, but I think one thing is just everybody feeling like it's their job, right? So right. it's not like, oh, that person's doing their job. This is my job. I'm going to stay in my lane. I'm going to stay in my silo. It's, it's this kind of spectrum of, okay, everybody sees that it's their job. The success of the enterprise is their job mm -hmm. and the, the risks, that's their job too. So I think that the, the idea that there's a kind of, you know, yes, you can have you know, second line risk functions, controlling functions, et cetera, but they're always going to be less effective as mm -hmm. the kind of primary decision makers seeing the, 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 seeing the spectrum of their job broadly. And then I think in addition to that, it is, um, you, you minimize sacred cows, right? So you, you, mm -hmm. you discuss the things that are undiscussable, right? You, you focus on the process. You talk a lot about how you work. You talk a lot about what's important about the work. Um, you can you continually ask yourself, are we focusing on the right thing? Right, that's this kind of idea, this sort of, you know, the double loop learning, right? Like, are yep. are we, does this still make sense? Are we still focusing on the right thing? And then, you know, I do really think that there is an element of um of of being able to communicate and being able to say, hey, this doesn't feel right to me, and and that being a way to sort of slow slow down, um, yeah. that being a cue for people to slow down. It, and uh, what I'm thinking about now is the time in the cockpit where we had the opportunity to speak up, even though we're junior to a senior pilot. Yeah. Um, we had that, we create that environment through team science, recruit resource management, creating a psychological safety, a culture of debriefing and things like there's so many things in there that we do. Yeah. Uh, but that allows us to say something when we see something and just, hey, yeah, yeah I remember when I was going through flight training. Uh, I saw a fire light while we were on deck and, uh, you know, went through the emergency procedures and uh, the 04, 05 I was flying with, the Marine Corps 05, uh, backed me up. He's like, hey, you know, he went, th you know, the ensign went through all his procedures correctly. He had a fire light, did everything right. You know, do we have a fire? No, but we had a fire light, which gave me. Yeah. Uh, and, and he knew that, hey, this guy's going to go through his process that he's supposed to go through in, in a time of extremity. So um, there's so many valuable lessons from the cockpit that you can come over. Uh, and then we're looking at Wall Street too. A question that I have about Wall Street, when you're managing other people's money, or, or not just you, but anybody, um, are you connected to that money? I mean, because is, is, you look at what's going on now and you look at what happened in, in 2007, 2008, um, we have a runaway market right now. I don't want to say a runaway market, but a market that's doing some things that we may not uh, agree with, uh, but the market's never wrong, right? Uh, <laughs> right. So, uh, right? Um, <laughs> It's it's uh or it might be wrong, but it's hard to bet against, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, if, if you're, yeah, it's the market's not wrong. You're wrong, right? That's that's where I've been ta uh, taught. So uh, when you look at managing money, other people's money, or, or watching others manage money and, and managing that risk, um, are they connected to it? They have a sense of purpose. Do they feel like it's their? I mean, how how do you, how do you, can you trust people to do that? Yeah, that's a great that's a great question. Um, so. You know, the, it's it's interesting, right? So I was talking with somebody about this the other day. Like, because my first really exposure to the markets as as a young adult was was on Wall Street and was seeing, you know, and, and the place I was at, I would say the the it was a it was you know we did statistical stuff, we did arbitrage. This wasn't a place that was doing analysis and picking companies because of their business models or whatever. But, but the thing that I really take away from that is, you know, man, if you think that you are somebody who is clever and you're, you're going to beat the market, like you really have to understand the amount of work that goes into people 
seeking out advantage in the capital markets and you know the amount of work the amount of money and things like that so so that that goes back to me you know the the book i read that most influenced my personal kind of approach to this stuff is um a random walk down wall street by burton malkiel mm-hmm. which was i think published in like 1950 1960 mm-hmm. something like that um and it's sort of the genesis of index funds right and to me like that's that's where you know am i always perfect at this no like you know do i do i react in ways that are you know all too human yes absolutely yeah. um but but part of my approach is to kind of like actually like let's see we can have as as few people involved as we want in this process right now it, you know i think i'm actually just transparently at a moment where i'm sort of thinking about this right now because the wall street part of me is like you know man, don't pay anybody any fees to manage your money, to do anything like that. The business owner in me is like, I, I, every moment that I'm not focusing on my business for something that I am, you know, that's not in my zone of genius, like I want to get that, I want to get that off my plate. So I actually am kind of at this interesting point of tension Um, in, in terms of like, how do you, I don't know, how do you trust somebody? I mean, here's, here is a place where I think, you know, regulation is not perfect, but it can be helpful. I mean, you know, I'm much more likely to trust the the a, a fidelity or a vanguard than I am to trust some you know <laughs> very small place. And so if I'm working with somebody who's not a, you know a major operator, um, not a fidelity, not a fidelity or vanguard, like boy, I want the back end to be fidelity and vanguard, and I want to be able to like you know see that directly, right? So right. it's interesting because I, I one of the things we talk about in, in meltdown is transparency as an antidote to complexity, or transparency as a kind of balance for complexity. And so this is kind of one of the one of the areas I think about that, like, I want as many direct touch points, you know, I don't want to have to be getting statements with my like money managers letterhead on it or whatever, right? I want to be able to log into Fidelity site and know that, okay, I am backed by all of Fidelity systems in terms of believing that, you know, those ones and zeros on the screen are actually ones and zeros that (laughs) that I could use at some point if I wanted to. All right. This triggered something. I'm I'm not sure I'm going to get this question right. I'm going to give it a shot. So yeah. the market's a complex adaptive system. Uh, we trust Fidelity and Vanguard there, right? Uh, our business, you and I run small, I wouldn't say small, we run uh, consultancies where we help yeah, organizations. Boutique. boutique. I like yeah, the word boutique. Right, boutique. And so we compete against McKinsey. All right. So in your context, you just shared with me about Vanguard and Fidelity. Let's trust in them. They're operating in this complex environment. Then why should anybody trust Clearfield? Uh, why should anybody trust what we do? Uh, why shouldn't they just go to McKinsey? Why shouldn't they just go to Accenture to navigate this complex world? Thoughts? Yeah, well, that's a that's a great question. And actually, I mean, I'll, I'll go back to my first, my first, my first answer, which is you shouldn't trust me, right? Like, so, so out of the gate, are you trusting me? No, like I would, I would, I would hope you, I would hope you're you're not. I mean, why, you know, why are why are you and I having this conversation? Well, because you know, I've put some stuff stuff out there that resonated with you, right? You've mm-hmm. you've you've read stuff of mine that that landed for you in a certain way. You know, the thinking has been been helpful. The way I try to earn people's trust is by um, by offering them value. So whether that's you know through things that I write, through you know content I produce, um, uh, or through getting on the phone with people and just talking with them about their leadership challenges, you know, the yeah. the, the 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 first thing I'm always doing is offering people value, um, hel- helping to reframe what they're saying, helping them to see things in a different, in a different way, um, helping them see, you know, maybe a different set of things that are possible if they're able to shift in a different way. And then the reason I have success with my clients is because I don't pull a McKinsey. I mean, I have a lot of friends at McKinsey. Yeah. I respect those people a lot. Um, I respect some of the stuff McKinsey does. Um, so I, I don't want this to be seen as, as, as bad mouthing McKinsey or bad mouthing right, the big right. four. Right. But I do think, or I'll say, and I do think that the, the model of, you know, kind of producing a nice report that you, or a, a comprehensive deck that you present to a client, I, I really think that model of intervention is dead because it's not mm-hmm. effective, right? So, so for me, you know, I'm effective in the way I work because I'm helping the leaders I work with build their own capacity as leaders and the capacity of their team. I want to make myself obsolete. That's always my hope with a client. Yeah. I don't want to be working on the same problem over and over again with them. I, w- I want to, you know, solve something or support them in solving something and then move on. And it's really that. It's like, like the way I work with people is 
I am not the sage on the stage, you know, offering them wisdom. I am not at the front with a with a with a PowerPoint deck, right? We are. If if I am sharing what I'm seeing, I will, you know, let's imagine a 90 minute meeting where I'm I'm presenting results um, from from some of the work we've done. It's mm -hmm. like 15 minutes or me talking about the results. Um, you know, 60 minutes or them reacting to it. And then the last 15, 15 minutes or the last 30 minutes, whatever it is are, okay, so how can I support you all in moving this forward? What are you going to do next? Yep. So I, I think that trust is earned. And, you know, I, I mean, my model is also, it's pretty fearless. Like I'm constantly telling my clients, I don't know the answer. And I think that's right. kind of anathema to a place like McKinsey or Accenture or, or wherever, where the whole notion is that you're the expert and you're coming in. And, and that has its place. Expertise has its place and it's not enough. And the more complex the problem is, the less valuable expertise is to first order. Absolutely. Let, let me repeat back to you what I, what I think I'm hearing. And that is you help organizations and leaders uh, build a higher quality, observe, orient, decide, act loop. The tools and techniques, the methods, what's in your toolkit come from lessons from the cockpit. Uh, could be aviation crew resource management, which helps out in communication and teamwork. You also examine things uh, from failure, uh, Maconda Well, Air France 447. You look at these things and go, what can we learn from that? You're exapping lessons from other domains. And then you're also taking lessons from risk management, maybe uh, maybe uh, an investor mindset, set, optionality, things, things that some people don't really understand, like how options markets work and things like that. How do you buy and sell something you don't own? And you're bringing that over to help them improve what they need to do to operate better and survive, thrive in this volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous environment. Is that, is that true? Yeah, it's interesting. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of absorbing your framing and there's parts of it that really resonate with me and parts of it that resonate a little bit less with me. So let me just, let me process that for a minute. Um, not a minute, a moment. Um, I'm just going to think for a second. So one thing I'll say is I, I never, so you, you talked about, you know, you dropped the OODA loop in there, right? And you and I are mm -hmm. here, we're kind of nerding about nerding out about yeah, the yeah. OODA loop. Um, I never, I almost never talk with my clients about the OODA loop because yeah. I'm always, I'm always talking in their language. You know what I mean? That's my goal. It's always to sort of, to sort of see things in their, in their language and support them in their language, at least initially, right? I, I will, mm -hmm. I will introduce things as, as we go on. So that is one of the things that I got curious about. Do I frame my own work in terms of the OODA loop? I think I do sometimes and, and sometimes I don't. Um, and then the only other thing that I would that I would add is, you know, one of the insights, so Meltdown came out in 2018. I started working with people kind of more and more, you know, consulting capacity, coaching capacity, working one on one with leaders, working with their teams, you know, helping them with with ambitious projects. Um, and one of the things I realized was that it took me a while, but so meltdown is all about the catastrophic downside of complex systems is, is kind of one way to frame it. And what I sort of realized is, oh, the same things that create the same interactions, the same complexity that creates catastrophic downside also makes teams much, much less effective, right? So, so that I think is, is in many ways how I, how I see my thinking now. Like I'm still dealing with complexity. I'm still, in, still supporting people working in complex systems. The challenge I'm going after now with most of my clients is not the challenge of how do you avoid catastrophic failure, but rather the challenge of how do you be performant, right? How do you be performant in, you know, the, in the modern economy, whether your business is you're a $700 million law firm or you're, you know, a multi-billion dollar multinational oil company, like mm -hmm. the challenges at the center of that are the same. And that's yes. kind of what I think is pretty, pretty interesting. Yeah. You, you and I are on the same page. Uh, so we could talk about complexity, uh, all the background behind complex adaptive systems. We could talk about the OODA loop with our clients. We could do that. But at the end of the day, it comes down to, in my, my view, uh, the way you work. And we have to give them those tools. Yeah. And you go back to David Marquet, Mission Command that we, we've learned from uh, the military uh, that's actually built in, in, in to the OODA loop. But we show folks, hey, let me show you how to mitigate cognitive biases. Let me show you how to perform as a team. Let me show you how to do effective communication, which you have a great example in your book. And I've actually been using something like that for, for a while uh, that we have. For, we, we borrow from Team Steps and, and Aviation Crew Resource Management. Um, and we show them these things. And to your point, it's, it's fractal, right? We can talk about fractality yeah. and all that. It, what, what happens at, uh, on an aircraft carrier 
The way they operate is no different than the way a software team operates. They're still humans working in a complex socio-technical system. It's those yep. interactions that matter. And it's, yep. it's, that's, what, that's what we want to focus on. So I, I agree with you. Uh, many times over, the language of complexity, uh, some of the things we show folks, you know, I, I think you studied a little bit of neuroscience. We get into the free energy principle and how we minimize surprise and how we actually perceive reality. Um, sometimes people are like, oh, that's great. I don't, I don't need to know this, but can you show me how to do an effective planning process with a team? <laughs> you know, so yeah, I, I'm with you. And so uh, let's, let's talk about complexity for a little bit. Uh, you've been at this for a while uh, on the complex, uh, complexity side of the house. What, what are you doing now to help leaders understand what complexity really is? What, what kind of methods or t- techniques are you using with uh, your clients? Yeah, that's a, I, I love that question. Um, um, I think what I have found, here's what I have found, that giving people a little bit of scaffolding goes a long way. So giving them a little bit of language that they can apply to their own context goes a long way. I just had, a, I just had an oil and gas leader that I've worked with for many years now. Um, he just wrote me, we were, we were just kind of emailing back and forth about Thanksgiving and what we're going to be up to in the next year together. Um, and I said, how was your Thanksgiving? And he said, it was great. He said, but I can't help think about the Thanksgiving story and meltdown and how much, you mm-hmm. know, how, how to make my Thanksgiving not complex and tightly coupled because he used that as one yeah. of the examples. Um, and I got such a kick out of that because, you know, th- th- that's a story that now he can, that's scaffolding that he can hang so much on, right? And like, mm-hmm. he's kind of joking with me about hanging his Thanksgiving dinner on it, but he's thinking about his work on it. He's thinking about, you know, how, how to make their processes more effective, more reliable, safer, all of those things, yeah. right? Because he's got that, he's got that knowledge in the background. So that's one thing, just a little bit of scaffolding, I think. But the other, the other thing that I, that I, I, I don't know if I would have answered, I don't know if I could have articulated this connection uh, before you asked that question. So I'm going to, I'm going to try this out and we'll see how it lands. So okay. The other thing I spend a lot of time doing, a lot of my energy doing when I am consulting, uh, consulting in particular, is, is being curious, right? So I'm, I'm always asking questions. I'm not taking anything as a given. I'm always asking questions about how this works, how different parts of their organization work together, how people feel about the work, how they feel about their jobs, all of those kinds of things, right? So I will do a lot of interviews in my consulting process, which, which is not, you know, is not so far out of the ordinary. But what I will give, almost regardless of what the problem is, if it's you know helping an innovation team uh, set up their strategy or helping a leader reorganize her leadership team, so much of what I'm doing is I'm absorbing their their organizational culture and then reflecting it back to them. And the way I reflect it back to them is I reflect back, hey, here here are a set of things that you're very very strong at, and here is the shadow side of those things. So you know. If you're really, really good at, at producing excellent, high quality work, um, that sounds like a great feature. And it is a great feature, right? You want to be part of an organization that can produce high quality work. The shadow side of that is it's harder for you to be agile. It's harder for mm-hmm. you to produce crappy work that gets you some insight about what you need to be working on, right? So I will often, I'm often presenting to leaders, to a leadership team, this kind of view of their organization and how they're working and so and then getting their reactions right seeing seeing how that lands for them and it's interesting because almost regardless of what the content of what we're working on is that they find that process very very valuable and i have a client who i'm thinking of right now i I did this with earlier in the year and every time we're talking they're constantly talking about the clearfield nine box matrix which is just you know these observations about what are they very strong at and and sort of what are some things that they could benefit from exploring, and then I'm supporting them in that exploration, and I'm helping using using that to help ra- help them raise their awareness of kind of the waters that they swim in, and as they're making decisions about things um, like a leader reorganizing her, her a CEO reorganizing her leadership team, for example, I'll be offering them feedback like, hey, do you see like how much you're caring for people in this discussion? You know, mm-hmm. it's really good to care for people, and you know, you know that this change is going to have an impact on people, so. How can you manage that impact instead of, you know, kind of preemptively caring for people? You can care for people right. by managing the impact, not by avoiding the hard thing. So, so maybe that's my answer. Like I'm, I'm constantly trying to 
support people by holding up a little bit of a mirror to what, what I am seeing in their organization. And it's not like, here's a mirror, this is right. It's like, here's the mirror. What do you all make of this? Right. Cause that's the right. most important thing. Right. Right. It's, it's the whole idea that, uh, we all perceive reality a little bit differently. So we need to, that, yeah. to have those feedback loops from each other. Uh, right. That's absolutely critical. Uh, there, there's so much more. There's the uh, what's happening now. We, I, I think we want to touch on that here in a moment. Uh, before we get into that, I want to take a look back at some of the uh, uh, some of your influences. I, I know you had Daniel Kahneman in the book. You had Daniel Pink. Um, you had uh, a little bit of the U.S. Navy in there. You had some accidents that we're very familiar with. Challenger, Columbia, Air France 447, which is a great story to talk about. Uh, that's five, six years in the past. What are your influences now? What are you reading? What What's helping you uh, maintain? You yeah, know, we're we're all professionals, but we're always students too. So how, yeah, yeah, how totally. You, I, I, I love that question. And in fact, I'm really I'm tempted to go over to my bookshelf and and just pull some sure. books. Sure. I I, mm-hmm. I sort my bookshelf by um, book last pulled. So like okay. there's there's a, there's a kind of you know a sort of frequency bias to it. Um, yeah. But I happen to have yeah. one book here on my desk that's the surprising power of liberating structures. Oh, Do you know yeah, this book? That, uh, absolutely. That's red teaming one hundred and one right there. That's yeah foundational. So, yeah. So this is such a great book and I, I love it philosophically and I love it practically too. So philosophically, basically this book says the world of top-down decision-making, the world of, you know, presenting out to people is just not as useful as you think it is. Right. And so, so right. often when I'm working in an organization, you know, <laughs> I remember working with a, a, an engineering leader at a, at an organization once and um, he was going in to do a big, a big presentation and, I was like, you know, let's call him John. I was like, John, how many, how many minutes you got here? He's like, 60 minutes. I was like, how many slides you got? He was like, 85 slides. I was like, John, you get to use five slides. Like, this isn't about you pushing information out to them. This is about you creating the, con- creating the conditions for an, an emergent discussion to happen. Because A, that's where you're going to get other people's wisdom. And B, that's actually how you're going to convince people. Like, you're not, I actually don't even like, that's how you're going to influence people. You're, yep. you're going to influence people by showing them that you too are willing to be influenced. And a book like this is just such a great, great resource for that. Such a great way to kind yeah. of think about I, I structures gotta get, like I that. I got to get Keith McCandless on our show. He's up in there. I think you're up in the Pacific Northwest. Yeah, uh, yeah. He's I'm in Seattle America. too, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I got to meet him when I was living up there. But liberating structures, are you using those techniques now uh, with leadership All the time. Teams? Okay. Yeah. So we I are use, too. I use so them we, all the time. Yeah. Yeah. This is, this is what I said about mitigating cognitive biases and uh, enabling critical thinking. The, the red team manual that we use from the UFMCS uh, from the military is built on liberating structures. A lot of work from Kahneman, cool. a lot of work from Klein, but that is foundational. I'm so glad you brought that up. I didn't know you were going to bring that one up, but that, that is central to everything we do. Pretty, pretty yeah, central. Yeah, and it's, it's not an accident that it's on my desk because I was recommending it to somebody uh, yeah, yesterday. Yeah. I mean, I really, I really reach for this. I really reach for this yeah. book all the time. No, that's great. Uh, what else? What else is on your bookshelf? Uh, uh, when we talk um, about research Let's sure. Take, take a take take a wander over with me, Punch. All right. Um, so I've got a I've got a couple here um, that I think are pretty pretty interesting. Um, this one I think is this is probably of what I pull. This is probably the most useful to kind of line leaders. It's called Beyond the Wall of Resistance. Mm-hmm. Um, it's written by a guy called Rick Maurer. Uh, he is. So the the school of coaching and consulting that I am grounded in is called Gestalt, which is kind mm-hmm. of all about seeing what is and supporting people to experiment with new ways of being. So, you know, I the coaching I do, I'm not a performance coach. Like we're not working on, you know, speeches or kind of how, you know, you're getting nervous or, or mm-hmm. whatever. The way I work with people is we work on an existential level. So like, what is it about who you are that makes this challenging? And what is it about who you are that, that's, that's really valuable? That's kind of the, the concept, like, you know, this is back to this strength shadow side. So a lot of what I do is help people see their strengths and in seeing their strengths, support them in getting curious about, about other ways of being, about other ways of, of kind of, you know, mm-hmm. trying things out. So, so this book, Beyond the Wall of Resistance, is about organizational change. It's about Stop seeing resistance as the enemy and, and start to see it as data about your problem. Um, and it, it introduces a model called the cycle of change, which I use all the time with my clients, almost regardless of the problem we're working on. I mean, everything involves change. Um, yeah. And it's so a really, you, it's, a, it's a great book. You brought up something there, seeing what is. Um, and then to us, when we talk about complexity, we start with 
the current cond condition. Where are we right now? Right. So yeah. we can't just come up and go, we want to be over there because in a complex right. environment, you can't really define that state, but it's easier to start. And it's not easier. We should start with what is right. Yeah. What is happening? What's happening on the external environment? What's happening inside? What yep. is use multiple and use liberating structures. I'll use that or red teaming techniques to leverage multiple perspectives to understand what is, what is happening right now. Let's start yeah. there. Right. Okay. And is that, is that very aligned to the, what you're working or the Gestalt approach? Yeah. So, so yes, it is. And, and, okay. and the, the Gestalt approach also posits that there's a value in what is right there. There mm -hmm. is a value in the way you're operating now. So, yeah. you know, to, to, to back to these organizational kind of uh, overviews that, that I was talking about, you know, there's really a value to, to being a perfectionist. There's really a value to producing high quality work. There's also a cost to it. So, but until you recognize the value, it's very hard to change something. So until you recognize what is now and, and why it is, what's the value there, it's hard to change. Um, you know, a, a, another thing I like is, you know, psychological safety, right? This ability for people to speak up, felt sense of candor is, is yeah. how I've heard Amy Edmondson describe it very succinctly. Um, if you're on a team that, that does not have a felt sense of candor, like, it's very easy to say, we want our team to, to be psychologically safe. I want my people to feel psychologically safe. And as you said, like, sure, that's a great place. That's a great desire. That's a great, that's mm -hmm. a great wish, but that is not a change strategy, right? You have to understand now, why aren't your people speaking up? What is the value that they get from not speaking up? Right. And it's yeah. often a sense of self-protection. It's often a sense of actually not wanting to harm your ego as the leader, right? So if, yep. if you, right? So, so that, that's, yeah, I think we're kind of on the same page. We're sort of converging about like, what is, what is happening now and what's the value of it? How do we get here? And that's always, right. that's gotta be the starting point. Otherwise you're kind of, you don't have anything to push against. Yeah. There's an interesting connection between crew resource management and psychological safety. When I uh, had a discussion with uh, uh, Dr. Edmondson a few years back, uh, work, when I was working for the Navy, uh, I asked her that question. Uh, were the teams that you looked at, the surgical teams you looked at, were they trained by aviators? And guess what? The answer was yes. <laughs> All right. hmm. So that's kind of cool. Um, so, so when we learned about psychological, it's funny. I was living up in Seattle years ago. We were talking about psychological safety seven, eight years ago, uh, right before the the Google, I forget the name of the Google thing came out. But uh, Aristotle, Project Aristotle. Aristotle. Yeah, thanks. And I remember as an agile coach back then, you know, here I am, this young agile coach talking about psych safety. And these people are looking at me like, these other agile coaches that are certified, and, you know, they these long uh, alphabet soup behind their, their names. They're looking at me like, what the hell are you talking about? I'm like, what do you mean? And of course, here everybody, you know, today's everybody is psycho yeah, a yeah. psychological safety expert. And I'm like, eh, I don't think so. Yeah. And let me tell you, this is important. Coming from aviation, um, and, and you've learned a little bit of the art and science of effective debriefing. Um, debriefing is, or, or after action reviews, or, or uh, yeah. uh, I forgot the submarine community calls and critiques from David Marquet. Uh, that's the most powerful way, uh, if done effectively, to create a psychologically safe environment is have a leader show some fallibility, right? How do you get yeah. leaders to stand up and say, hey, over the last two weeks or week or whatever, I, I failed this, right? Yeah. Immediately, boom, you start to create that uh, psychological safety. Uh, so yeah, I, I really appreciate that, that, that insight there on, on um, uh, both liberating structures and psych safety. Yeah, and two two things there that I think one is kind of just a funny story. One is uh, one is a, a um, kind of a more a more a more serious uh, take on on what you just said, or kind of building on what you just said. So the funny story is I like how you said you know everybody's an expert in psychological safety now because it is really interesting to see kind of this idea catch on. And I was actually I was with Amy Edmondson and um, Roger Martin and some other folks at a at a dinner where Amy won the the what i think they called it the breakthrough idea award or something like mm -hmm. that for her for her work on psychological safety and she was sort of chagrined because she said you know it's a breakthrough idea that's been around for 25 years or or whatever it was so it yeah. is it is interesting i mean it's kind of you know the classic adoption diffusion question just sort of we're we're seeing it kind of lived out right um so that's i think a like a sort of a funny thing on it that i'm 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 with you on it's interesting to see sort of how it how it is sprouting up and for the for the better right i mean thank yeah. goodness people are talking about this stuff now right because before you didn't again back to that scaffolding you didn't have the scaffolding or the model for people to, to kind of to sort of connect with it 
Um, but the thing I wanted to, to, to build on about the debriefs, so, so I have, this, um, I have this, this program I've just launched, which is called the, mm -hmm. the Clear Path to Executive Leadership, which is CLEAR as an acronym. Um, I won't go into depth now, but it's kind of these, these pillars that I think I see leaders, um, especially as they get more senior and they can rely less on their expertise, they sort of, they need something to replace it. And so CLEAR is um, curiosity, listening, empowerment, accountability, and results. And I've got this program. It's a 12-week program. It's a mix of kind of content and, and coaching and group coaching and mm -hmm. things like that. It's great. I can, I can talk more about it. But one of the things I was talking with one of, my, one of the participants about earlier this week was that the, the power of building a container. So a debrief, an after-action review is a container. It, is, it right. is a strong container with a specific set of rules. Here's how we talk about things. Here's how, you know, Here's, here's what we're focused on. Um, one of the rules basically is you don't hold what people share in this container. You don't hold that against them in the container or outside the container, right? So there's just kind of yeah. like rules. You think about the liberating structures, we, we, right? We call that, we call that the, you know, the Las Vegas rule. What happens in the debrief stays in the debrief. <laughs> yeah, to totally, yeah. totally. Yeah. So, you, so you've got this really strong container. Liberating structures is all about building strong containers. Right. It's all about, mm -hmm. okay, here's the specifics of how we're going to operate in this moment. And depending on the kind of organization, confidentiality, right? There's there's all sorts of stuff that can go into that. I don't think that most leaders understand A, how to build containers, or B, the power mm -hmm. that crafting a container like that has. And so this is actually part of what I'm teaching in this course. This is part of what I'm offering yep. in this course because it is so powerful. I can, you know, I can work with a very, very senior leader who struggles to do these kind of retrospectives or struggles to to put into place a kind of learning element um and it's like man you just need to understand how to build a container how to bring people into it how to run it yeah. and then how to let people out of it and boy your effectiveness when you can build a container it's like it doubles instantly it's pretty incredible there, there's something on uh when you brought up clear and accountability and the discussion we just had um so a container you put a container on them and you build a cadence and we call it a cadence of accountability, really? Yeah. Which is the, for us, we use accountability as the ability to recount what happened, right? So yes. it's, it's going back to is like what, what's happening now and, and what happened, what happened in the past, right? And when you look at meltdown, you actually look back at the, what happened in the black box of the cock from the cockpit voice recorder. That's a, what happened, right? Yeah. It's not the attitudes and beliefs about uh, what should be better in the future. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Cool. Hey, so on on the topic of meltdowns, um, so much has changed in the last uh, five years doing math in public since 2018. Here, here we are in 2023, about to go into 2024. Uh, what are the big concerns right now? What are you seeing as uh, tightly coupled systems moving forward with going into 2024? It could be AI, it could be quantum computing, it could be uh, you know uh, offshoring. What what are you seeing out there as a major threat? <laughs> um. Yeah, I mean, boy, AI is fascinating, right? I mean, mm -hmm. just just um, AI is fascinating because to me, there's there's a part of AI that um, we were talking about adoption, adoption diffusion a minute ago. Like, there's mm -hmm. a part of AI that just breaks the adoption diffusion model because because at some point, mm -hmm. it. I'm making this up right now, by the way, Punch. So okay. so, <laughs> so I'm not I'm not very confident about this thinking, but I'll offer it, and we can. We can, we can tease it apart. You know, if you are the professional services firm, if you are the law firm, if you are the X firm that figures out how to harness AI to do the work of, you know, 10 times your current workforce at a 10th of the cost effectively, or at least effectively enough for most mm -hmm. of your client problems, suddenly it doesn't matter if the rest of the industry adopts it because the rest of the industry is going to go away very, very quickly. Right. I think, so I think just from a business perspective, there is a really, really interesting phenomenon here that the scalability of this stuff is just built in from the start. And it doesn't have to be adopted in the same way that other, other technologies get adopted. I think the, the kind of ratchet or the push to push this stuff forward. And admittedly, I'm kind of grounded in the legal space a little bit. I'm grounded in the, you know, professional okay. services firms. I do work with those kinds of folks. Um, so, so there, there is a, probably a bias to my thinking in that, but, but boy, I do think that that's so interesting that like, yeah. yes, there's this idea of the singularity, what happens? I have no idea what happens. I don't, I don't know that anybody knows what happens. You know, there's a couple of different camps. I mean, pretty, pretty interesting to, to follow from afar, but 
when it comes to how this is going to affect the world of work, I mm-hmm. also don't know how it's going to affect it, but I'm, I feel pretty confident that it's going to affect it, right? I mean, it, it's affected mm-hmm. my work already, and we're in the baby steps of this whole thing. Yeah. So as I look back to like Air France 447 or uh, I forgot the Eastern Airlines 401, uh, and then you look back to um, the 737 MAX, so you have automation coming into the cockpit, right? Yeah. Um, human capability goes down and you have, yep. I don't know if you call it a tightly coupled uh, system. It might be there. Uh, it's kind of has unknowns, known unknowns in there. Um, now we're putting humans in a situation where techno- we're becoming more dependent on technology, right? Or could be. Um, th- to me, that becomes a threat to seeing another Macondo well uh, another plane crash, you know, so that's how I'm thinking through this right now is are, there are lessons we learned already over the last hundreds of years from accidents that we should be bringing forward into this world of, um, AI. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm with you on that. And I think, you know, mm-hmm. the, the, one of the challenges I think is, um, basically most, most of us, most humans, we're not very good proofreaders, right? We're not very good we're not very good at catching small mistakes inside, you know, larger things. And, and with our complex systems, those small mistakes can really matter, right? Those small mistakes can spiral mm-hmm. into, into bigger things. So one of the things that I I'm, I'm, think is pretty interesting about AI from, from this kind of complexity perspective is how there's just no, there's no insight into where anything came from. You know, you can type in something into ChatGPT. It gives you a very comprehensive response. You actually don't know how that response got constructed. You don't know where that response came from. Now, you also don't know where the response from another human came from. So, so there's kind of, mm-hmm. there's sort of an element of that where we sort of, you know, there's a lot of back explaining of our, of our thinking and reasoning and things like that. But, but that's sort of where I think it's like, you know, like with automation, I mean, you can, you can talk about sophisticated automation, you can talk about, but even just, you know, I'm sure you know that that video, the children of the magenta line, right? It's like hmm. the the you know the American Airlines training captain. I don't remember his name, but you know this was 25 years ago, saying, "Hey, as aviators, we've got to be able to maintain situational awareness and pay attention without all of this automation. As soon as we start believing the automation, you know, there's 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 kind of there's something hmm. wrong, right? So I don't know how we think about keeping humans in the information loop. Um, right. where it matters. Cause it's, you know, th- these technologies are so much more capable than us in some things, except in some sense in recognizing their own fallibility. Right. So, right. so it's a, it's a paradox. I mean, how do you think about that? I, I'm, I'm struggling with it right now. Uh, you, you know, a lot of, uh, uh, predictive maintenance, predictive capabilities are being brought onto companies at the moment. Uh, and I, w- what I see there is, hey, remember the pedostatic tubes on the Air France 447 freezing up or look back at the uh, burnt out light bulb of Eastern Airlines Flight 401. People lose situational awareness. They lose the capability. Um, you look at probable, uh, you know, probable, plausible and possible in risk management, the, the fat tail approach. Uh, how is that system going to pick that 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 fat, fat tail up that that uh, um, I guess it's plausible? You know, how do we how do we pick up those things in a complex system? In my view, and this comes from a lot of it comes from the work in uh, with Dave Snowden, is uh, you need a human sensor network to to understand what's going on, right? AI yeah. is going to be part of that. Um, and the, think about this: AI could work quite well in the checklist world, right? The things that we know. And so, if you go through your flight, your your, your checklist in the cockpit, yeah. you have to do these things, right? There, yeah. There's no way out of them, right? Um, and if you fail to do them, you're gonna you may see a uh, uh, a disaster or a crisis, and it'll be temporary. Um, so AI could help out in that space. So more on the ordered system part of the space. That's how I'm looking at it is humans are going to be pretty darn good on the complex side. Um, maybe that artificial intelligence will free us up to to think a little bit more clearly. I think what's more important now is the use of things like liberating structures. That is technology that's, that's like liveware technology, right? Yeah. That's what we need, you and I need to be focusing on instead of going off and, and telling folks, hey, you need to automate this and that. It's, hey, yeah. I have to bring your human capability up to, to actually survive and thrive in this environment. That, that's, that's kind of how I'm thinking through this. Yeah, I love that. That, that, that brings to mind something I wrote um, a, probably a couple of years ago. Um, you know, I see a lot of leaders that talk about data-driven decision-making and, you know, they need more data and they, they kind of, they need, they need to understand more. And 
my response to that is most leaders do not actually need more data, right? Because it's such a complex system that the, the data is not that helpful in many, many instances. Um, unless you've kind of prescribed a very specific experiment and you're very clearly testing a specific hypothesis, that's when data is useful. The thing that I think that leaders need to be able to do more and more is pay attention to their feelings and pay attention to the hmm. feelings of others. It's like the yeah. felt experience of being with somebody, man, that gives you so much data about how something is going. You can pay attention to your own reactions to an idea. If you can, if you can lead yourself and manage your own reactivity, if you can really learn to listen to people, right? So, yeah. you know, the, the idea of this curi curiosity and listening pair that I have in this leadership framework is expertise isn't enough anymore. We've got to let that expertise kind of rest in the background. It, it doesn't mean, you know, get rid of your engineering credentials. It doesn't mean, you know, shred your, your, your books on software engineering, but it does mean that as you get more senior, so much more of what you do comes by building relationships with people, being curious, and really being able to listen, being able to listen and understand what people are saying. And that act of listening creates a container where people get to do their best thinking and they go out and solve those problems. That's well, how I think about it. Yeah, no, that active listening piece is in our book, The Flow System as well. Uh, you brought up another thought here. Um, I read The Extended Mind by uh, it's Annie Murphy Paul like a year ago. Um, I don't one know of the things she point one of the things she pointed out, and this connects back to Wall Street and, and what you just talked about. Uh, what makes a good trader is the interoceptive skills, their connection to the world. How how are they connected to their uh, you know the, 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 their sensations of the external world? That's what you're talking about here. Is how do we create that within an organization? How are leaders connected to their people? How do we sense each other's uh, emotions and things like that? How do we create that mental? I hate, I hate to say mental health, but how do we uh, attack well-being, and this connects back to psychological safety as well as um, this is what we're going after. That's why I think you and I are, are kind of aligned in this conversation is this is what matters, not so much the technology, but it's, it's the, the liveware approach to things. Yeah. And I, I got a quick story about that, which I just love. So this is with the, this is kind of like a hard-nosed engineering team at an oil and gas company that I've been working with for a couple of years. And they they are doing they are working differently than their peers. They are working differently than the rest of the people in the organization, and they are bringing that different way of working to the rest of the people and meeting a lot of resistance as, as doing it. And so, I've worked with them over the years on kind of this idea of how do you earn the right to be right? How do you earn the right to you know not show up with the data and kind of bludgeon people with it, right? <laughs> like like bring out your data sticks and sort of whack people with it. But but how do you do that? And and the thesis that I have and what I have. Uh, brought to them is you do that by building relationships, by listening, by the way you're influential is by also being willing to be influenced. And people deep down, they know that they, they resonate with that. So one of the, one of the guys on this team I'd worked with for about a year, he and his boss and a couple other people from the team are in a meeting. They've done a lot of prep work to get to this point. They've got this thing that they want this very senior leader to sign off on. They've done all this work with, you know, his staff, his team, other people, lots of stakeholders. They're pretty sure that they're on to something. They're pretty sure that they're on to, to, to something because they've gotten a lot of feedback about it. And they know that this guy has resistance because he's expressed it through subordinates. He's expressed it in different ways. And one of the things I worked with them on was how do you think about resistance? How do you categorize resistance in different ways? And how can you work skillfully? So the story I, I, I heard, I wasn't there. The story I heard was um, this, this guy, let's call him Jed. Jed's going into this meeting. He's leading the meeting off. He spends like a couple of days before this meeting, studying this, this kind of taxonomy of resistance that I've given him. Mm -hmm. He's thinking through it. So he goes in this meeting and he says, hey, you know, Josh, I've got a deck that I'd like to take you through. And I'm, and I'm happy to do that. But before I do, I just wanted to know, would you be willing to share some of the concerns you have about this program that we're talking about? And it just opened the floodgates. It was like this guy just hit all this pent up energy, hit all this pent up resistance. And he just shared. And, you know, Jed, my client, he's kind of managing his anxiety a little bit, like, oh, I'm not going to get this stuff. But he kind of knows. He's sort of a believer. He's trying this out, you know. So he just stays with him. And what, 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 his, what his boss uh, shared with me later was he said, he said, I've never seen anybody bring up so many objections and talk himself out of them so quickly. Nice. So it was like yeah. all this guy wanted, he just wanted to be heard, right? And there is just yeah. such a deeply human level of, 
We just want to be heard. We just want to be seen. We just want to be understood. We really deep down, you know, we are social primates. We just deep down want to connect with people. And somewhere along the way in our corporate world, that has gotten lost. Like that as the underpinning to how we work together has gotten lost. And it's not to say that the other stuff isn't important. It's not to say that data is not important. It's not to say the effective mm -hmm. is not important. But what it is, what I am saying and what I, what I see over and over again is that when people just loosen their grip a little bit on those things, the things they're comfortable with, their expertise, the things they're familiar with, their, ex their, their effectiveness goes way, way up because suddenly they are yep. relating to other people as humans, as the humans that they are, not as the kind of, um, you know, work, uh, ho ho there's probably a term we could coin here, right? So there's homo economicus, there's like, you know, mm -hmm. homo jobis or whatever. Like we, <laughs> we imagine that these people at work are not humans because we, we carve out such a narrow slice yeah. for them to show up as. And no, when you start, when you can learn to relate to people as humans, when you can use curiosity and listening as your tools of engagement, you are a hundred times more effective because you don't get caught in resistance. Yeah. Right, right. Now, speaking of uh, human connectedness, I just want to thank you for coming on uh, No Way Out today. This has been uh, amazing. I've been looking forward to connecting with you for many years. Let me tell you some background on that before uh, I turn it over to you. So 2017, mishaps at sea. We had the USS McCain, USS Fitzgerald yeah. running to each uh, other ships at sea. 2018, I came back in the Navy. Uh, we went pretty deep with complex adaptive systems, uh, psych safety, uh, Kahneman's work, uh, even liberating structures, red teaming things. A lot of, a lot of things that we've already talked about today. Uh, about a few months after that, I think your book came out in November of 2018. Is that about right? Came out a little bit early. I think I think okay. March, but I don't remember. Yeah, March. Okay. Yeah, if I remember right, I, I, I was reading it and like, this is what we need to put in front of military leaders right now because it, it, it has everything that we were talking about. It's like everything that, um, by the way, I was the only aviator on the team of surface warfare officers. So I'm like talking like, hey, this is what we do in aviation. I'm like, well, that's not going to work here. I'm like, you're human, right? Um, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, and, and sure. I, well, I, I doubt that now, but and I'm I'm leaving the Navy here in a few months anyway from the reserve side. So, um, <laughs> yeah. So we, you know, I'm reading your book on this is awesome. This has everything that we need to discuss or we needed our leaders to learn about. So I highly recommend uh, military leaders, not just military leaders, but anybody who's interested in what complexity is, uh, what we can learn from. Failure, uh, Maconda Well, Air France 447. There's some, go grab that book now, go read it. Uh, reach out to Chris, uh, reach out to any of us to go, hey, uh, help me out and, and how do I implement this type of thinking in my organization? So Chris, I wanna thank you for that. And I, but I do wanna turn it over to you to, uh, you know, how, how do our listeners get in contact with you and, and what do you, what are you doing next? Are you writing another book by any chance? Yeah, it's a great question. So I'm, I, I've got, I've got. Well, right now I'm focused on, on, on creating this leadership, uh, this leadership program that I've been talking about, the, the clear path to executive leadership. And I stood it up uh, just a couple months ago. Um, been in development for a while. Um, kind of la laid the groundwork, and then we're sort of building it, um, building it on the fly. Um, got a lot of real. I, I did about. I don't know, probably about 30 interviews at different leaders all across different sectors uh, as part of kind of really seeing what the universal challenges of, of that people were facing in terms of leading in, in complex systems. So I think probably next for me is a book that is more about the leadership side of this. So it's more about kind of, you know, Meltdown is about the system side of it. And there's leadership right. pieces in there that I think are really effective. And there's a real gap between, you know, what we recommend in Meltdown and sort of how do you bring these practices to your team? And I, I recognize that gap, especially as yeah. I started working with folks after the book came out. Um, so I'm really proud of Meltdown. I think the next book will be something that, you know, somebody can take and work with very, work with very practically. Um, the thing that I want to offer people is, so I've been talking a lot about curiosity. I've been talking a lot about expertise and we've been talking about kind of, you know, what are the limits of expertise? How do, how do you kind of, um, how do you work around that? And I actually have, I've, I'm, I'm sharing one of the videos from my program about curiosity uh, for free that folks can go and download and can join my mailing list and kind of get in touch with me that way. Um, so to, to get that, you can go to clearfieldgroup.com slash expertise, and then that'll bring you to that video. Um, you can, you can you know, put in your email address and, and download that. And I think that's actually a great place to start the conversation in many ways, because, you know, I'm not offering tools. I'm, 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 I, there's no, there's no, I mean, I do offer some tools. I do offer some tips, tips, but like 
really what, what I'm offering people is a different paradigm and an entry into a different way of thinking and a different way of working as you and I have talked about. Um, and so my, my hope is that this video is a useful way for people to start to get in touch with that and start to kind of connect with that and sort of see, you know, see, see what, see what that is, see what that can look like for them and how they can apply that in their leadership. And actually inside this program too, we are talking explicitly about paradigms. How do you see the paradigms that you're currently operating in, your team are currently operating in, and how can you be thoughtful about that and sort of keep what works and, and change what doesn't? Um, yeah. So, so, so there's a whole element of that. So clearfieldgroup.com slash expertise. That's a really good way to, you know, to kind of start our relationship. Um, and, you know, there'll be a chance through that to book a call with me, to chat with me, that, that kind of thing. I love talking with people about their, their leadership challenges. Um, and then other than that, uh, that's, that's really the best way. I also, I do a lot on LinkedIn so people can connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, I'm not so active on X slash Twitter anymore for, for mm -hmm. obvious reasons, but yeah, LinkedIn and then clearfieldgroup.com slash expertise. Awesome. Well, I appreciate your time, Chris. Uh, we'll talk to you soon and we'll uh, see you. Hopefully we'll see you again here on No Way Out, maybe in about a year or so to talk about, hopefully we're not talking about a massive meltdown, maybe something else. Yeah. Let's <laughs> right. stay, let's stay positive. Yeah. No, that, I'd, yeah, I'd, stay I'd, positive. I'd, <laughs> I'd love to come back and um, yeah, thanks for the invitation. Thanks for the great conversation. It's really fun. All right. All right. Thank you.